Thank you, Nicola. Uh, fortunately for us, Bill does have a co-author, so we will proceed. Um, Stephen L. Davis grew up in Dallas. His writings have appeared in the Texas Monthly, Texas Observer, San Antonio Express News, and other publications. He's written two books on Texas culture, and he is the longtime he is a longtime curator at the Whitliff Collections at the Texas State University in San Marcos, where they hold the uh, works of Cormac McCarthy, Sam Shepard, and others. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks, Jerome. It's great to be here. After all that has been written about um, the JFK assassination in Dallas, it uh, struck me as that, that it seemed to make sense to kind of want to go back to square one, to, to chronicle events as they happened um, in Dallas in 1963. But dis despite the, the title of the book, that's not where you start. And I was wondering what led you to start uh, with Nikita Khrushchev in 1959? Well, I wish Bill was here to answer that question, but um, I will say that what we wanted to do really uh, is tell kind of a lost history um, over the years, uh, particularly with all the conspiracy theories that have kicked up a lot of dust and really kind of fragmented our understanding of what happened to John Kennedy when he came to Dallas. We've sort of lost sight of what life was like then and what the context was for the city, which at that time became notorious in America as a city of hatred. It was a place that uh, Kennedy had been warned by people not to visit. And it was a place where the morning of November 22nd, when he was coming into town, he told his wife, well, we're headed into nut country today. And, you know, Bill and I, uh, both longtime observers of culture in Texas, we've both been fascinated for a long time by the stories that we that kind of seeped out about Dallas during those years. And I will say, too, as a curator at a literary archive, um, one of the great novels ever written in Texas is about the Kennedy assassination in Dallas. It's written by a guy named Bud Shrake, who was a longtime reporter in Dallas, and it's called Strange Peaches. And I'm delighted to see Bud's son, Ben Shrake, is here today. And partly what motivated uh, Bill and I was to do this nonfiction version of Strange Peaches, to really delve in to showing how the city acquired this reputation. And of course, you know, you can't do that starting in November 1963. It, it's amazing how many books begin, you know, four days before the assassination. And so really we went backwards to to show how this kind of increasing sense of menace developed in Dallas. And Khrushchev comes into it because there were really two things that were uh, making people very nervous at that time. Um, one was the, the threat of the Soviets, uh, the Soviet infiltration you know, that seemed to be undermining America. And there was a lot of anxiety about that in Dallas. And then also, of course, civil rights and integration. You know, this was the time when those battles were on the front lines of, of the city here. And so these two qualities really uh, drove a lot of what was happening in Dallas. And Kennedy was seen by, and I, want to, and I don't want to go on too long, I'm sorry about this, but I do want to say from the beginning that Bill and I make this very clear in the book. There was a hell of a lot of love for John Kennedy in Dallas. 200,000 people showed up to show their support for Kennedy or to show their respect for the office of the president the day that he arrived. We're talking about a very small handful of people Yet these happen to be some of the most powerful people in the city who basically distorted the city's image. When I started reading the book, um, I don't consider myself you know, incredibly knowledgeable about Dallas, but having worked at the, the news for 20 years, you, you pick up a lot of things. And I, I, as the book critic, I, I'd read a fair amount. So I was going through thinking, well, this is nothing new. This isn't heard that, heard that, heard that. And then I started hitting things I didn't know, hadn't heard, and I started making, recognizing connections that I wasn't aware of. What surprised you? What didn't you know going in that really surprised you? Well, I will say, that, you know, I, I alluded earlier to how these stories had been seeping out about Dallas over the years and become kind of the folklore of Texas in some ways. Um, the story, for example, that some of you may know of Ted Dealey, the publisher of the Dallas Morning News, who in October 1961 uh, was invited to the White House for a publisher's luncheon and went there and told John Kennedy to his face, America is looking for a man on horseback to lead this country. And too many of us in Texas and the Southwest think you're riding Caroline's tricycle. <laughs> and you know, that's probably an example of a story that you were aware of, as were we. Um, and then you know, there's various other stories, the attacks on Kennedy's religion, led by Reverend W.A. Criswell of the First Baptist Church, the largest Baptist congregation in the country. And 
what we were really benefited from is going into the archives and being able to really piece together a lot of the stories from that time and show how these events developed and how these people came together in their opposition of Kennedy. So they were uh, remarkable surprises all along. And I'll talk about one in particular. Um, have any of you heard of the Meek Coat Mob? There, there will be a, a photo here. You'll see Congressman Bruce Alger, another city leader in Dallas, holding up the sign that said, LBJ sold out to Yankee socialists. Um, this was something that Lawrence Wright had written about very uh, elegantly in his memoir uh, about growing up in Dallas in the New World. And uh, when Bill and I started looking at this, Congressman Alger, uh, his archives are at the Dallas Public Library, and he was intensely proud of his accomplishments, including uh, leading this mob attack against Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson. It was very surreal. Uh, it was staged by many of Dallas's uh, leading citizens, best dressed people. And um, so going into the archives, we were able to sort of piece together exactly how this developed. And I think the real surprise that came out of that is, um, you know, before this mob happened, four days before the 1960 election, you had Richard Nixon up in the polls in Texas. He had about a six-point lead over John Kennedy and LBJ in Texas. Texas was crucial for Kennedy to win the presidency. And that's why Lyndon was back here campaigning in Texas. You know, he didn't want to have to be here doing that. And so the Alger and, and his people basically were looking to sort of just do the final death throttle to the Kennedy-Johnson campaign. And um, what happened is uh, these people were closing in on the Johnsons, spitting on them, cursing at them, waving picket signs perilously close to Lady Bird. They were walking uh, from the Baker Hotel to the, the, to the office. Exactly. And uh, LBJ, uh, his political instincts kicked in when he noticed the television cameras. And so he made all the bodyguards, all the cops get out of the way, and he just took Lady Bird with him, assumed a look of pious martyrdom, and moved as slowly as he could through that crowd. And uh, LBJ had an aide, some of you may know of, uh, Bill Moyers, who said later, you know, if Lyndon could have thought that up, he would have thought that up. <laughs> and that night, the images played on national television, and there was a huge backlash against the Nixon campaign, against Alger, and it put Dallas on the map as this crazed place where these e extremists were basically attacking candidates in the streets. And what Bill and I were both surprised because when we were looking at this, it seemed that the Mink Coat mob really turned the election around for Kennedy and Johnson, particularly in Texas and other places across the South. We had very conservative uh, segregationist senators like Richard Russell from Georgia who had refused to endorse the Kennedy ticket after they saw this gracious Southern woman being spat upon by these Nixon supporters, Richard Russell flew to Texas, campaigned with LBJ the final days, and made it okay for conservative Southerners to go ahead and support the, the Democrats in this election. And we were surprised that so few historians had really given the mink coat mob the recognition it deserved as a very pivotal influence on the election. But in the archives, uh, in Richard Nixon's presidential library, you will find an Oval Office recording of him after he became president talking to one of his advisors about why he lost in 1960 in this very close election. And he said, well, we lost Texas in 1960, you know, because of that asshole congressman in Dallas. So, so there's a surprise. <laughs> I think it's, it's significant that your uh, book, as you said earlier, makes the distinction uh, between uh, the reception Kennedy received um, in Dallas and the, uh, the kind of uh, city uh, political structure, city fathers, that kind of thing. Uh, many people often make the argument that, that uh, Dallas didn't deserve the, the, the nomenclature, the, the moniker city of hate. But your book uh, makes the case that, basic, that basically Dallas earned that before the assassination. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what you saw from the time Kennedy was running for office with the attacks on his religion and, and you know, the, the signs calling him a socialist and so forth, and then through his presidency where these attacks intensified, basically you saw this uh, minority of, of very extreme leading citizens, uh, Reverend Criswell, H.L. Criswell, Hunt, who... Uh, as many of you know, uh, bankrolled a radio program called Lifeline that was heard on hundreds of stations across the country. And uh, I think 10 million listeners was the estimate of how many people heard this program every day. It was carried on two stations in Dallas. 
And, you know, Lifeline injected this fear in, into people that John Kennedy would surrender sovereignty of the United States to the UN, to the United Nations. And when Kennedy proposed Medicare, you know, the Lifeline uh, Hunt's radio announcer went on the air to say that Medicare would lead to government death panels, that it would make the president of the United States a medical czar. And notice how they use this Russian word for dictator, czar, to describe Kennedy. A medical czar with life or death power over each individual citizen. And you had all these attacks emanating from Dallas. Dallas was notorious. Um, and it really kind of culminated a month before Kennedy's visit. Um, Stanley Marcus, one of the people you'll see in the photos, he's uh, at, at Neiman Marcus with Coco Chanel, was really one of the great heroes in Dallas during the, these years because he saw the threat that the absolutists, as he called them on the far right, represented to his city. And um, Stanley actually was a closet supporter of Lyndon Johnson and John Kennedy. He did not want to offend his best customers who hated both of them. But uh, Stanley was actually sponsoring the luncheon that LBJ came to speak at when the Mink Coat Mob riot, uh, riot erupted. And you know who sold those ladies those mink coats? Uh, it was Stanley Marcus. <laughs> And he had to cross in front of them to join LBJ. And Lady Bird said later, you know, he lost a lot of his best customers that day. Um, well, Stanley uh, had this vision of Dallas, this idea that Dallas would become a very international, cosmopolitan, world-renowned city, uh, beautiful cultural productions and so forth. And he saw that vision being hijacked by these people. And, you know, he sent, you can see in the archives here at SMU, it's a wonderful collection. You can see where Stanley was lobbying the other Citizens Council members, the, the city leaders, for years to integrate the city before it happened, finally. And he was also sending letters to the publisher of the Dallas Morning News telling him his newspaper was responsible for creating this climate of intolerance in the city, Stanley's word for hatred. Um, and so a month before Kennedy came, all of this kind of activity really culminated because Stanley had this wonderful idea to uh, invite the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Adelaide Stevenson, to town to really um, set people, to educate people in Dallas about the fact that the U.N. did not pose a threat. It was a great instrument for peace in the world. And you've, I'm sure you've seen the images of what happened to Adelaide when, when he came to Dallas. And it was a disgrace for Dallas. That was what the Dallas Times Herald put on its front page, Dallas disgraced. And at that point, the city leaders who had sort of stood idly by, and really a lot of ordinary people who had just been intimidated by this welling anger uh, propagated by powerful people. Um, the city leaders went in, the grown-ups went in and shut down the bullies at that point. There were apologies that came out from Dallas, and everybody really was uh, told that we want to make this, there was a fear that Kennedy would cancel his visit, that Dallas would be disgraced even more. But the idea was that we will reject what those people, those extremists stand for, and we will show President Kennedy, we'll give him a warm Texas welcome, which 200,000 people did. Your, your book traces, follows these events through uh, individuals. We, we, we track Stanley Marcus, for instance. Uh, how did you decide on, some of them obviously make sense, but some of the others uh, are uh, generally unknown to history, like Frank McGee and the National Indignation Convention and mm -hmm. things like that. I mean, what made you decide on, on this cluster of people? Well, you know, when we were researching this, uh, you just come across people who are too incredibly interesting and larger than life to leave out of the narrative. And Frank McGee was one of those. Um, he's the guy who founded, you may have heard of, the National Indignation Convention. Dallas was its headquarters. And, um, you know, it was a very competitive environment erupting. Uh, people were attracted to Dallas. Uh, very ultra-conservative activists were attracted to Dallas because of the money, because of the promise that H.L. Hunt would fund them. And um, Frank McGee was really uh, pretty good at raising cash. He was actually convicted later for uh, raising too much cash with uh, fraud. Uh, actually, he defrauded uh, General Walker, for example. But um, he had this problem of trying to distinguish the National Indignation Convention from other organizations that were more established, like the John Birch Society. He denounced them as too left-wing. Right. He said that the uh, John Birch Society is far to the left of the National Indignation Commission. We denounce the liberal taint of the John Birch Society. And um, these uh, gatherings of the National Indignation Commission were quite um, surreal and uh, extraordinary, really. You had, um, you had a speaker, uh, 
come up to say, you know, the usual stuff about how Chief Justice Earl Warren should be impeached uh, because, you know, supporting the Brown v. Board decision and other anti-Christian acts. And the person who followed him was a guy some of you may have heard of named J. Evitz Haley, uh, who is a pretty well-known historian still today and had done a lot of important historical work, became kind of an arch conservative. Um, he followed the speaker to the stage at this meeting and said, well, my predecessor here has turned moderate. All he wants to do is impeach Earl Warren, whereas I'm for hanging him. And, uh, you know, cheers, fill the rafters. Um, and so you had a lot. And by the way, I mentioned that Ronald Reagan addressed the National Indignation Convention and uh, told them that the progressive income tax, some of you may have heard of that, uh, was an idea spawned by Karl Marx. So you had a lot of people kind of riding that wave at that time. McGee ultimately is one of the people who stands up and starts yelling at Stevenson. Yeah, he's the one, if you see the YouTube video, uh, the man trying to shout down Stevenson um, during that uh, lecture that Stevenson gave that address. And that's the one where Stevenson finally tells him, you know, sir, I don't have to come here from Illinois to teach Texas manners, do I? And um, Stevenson, by the way, did great um, at his talk. You know, Stanley Marcus introduced him, and Stanley was one of those people who was really, you know, quite eloquent, uh, spoke, you know, was never at a loss for words. And when he got up there and faced this incredibly hostile crowd, you know, the words just kind of fled from him. He was not used to a situation like that. You know, there was people parading out the upside down American flags. Have any of you seen the, the upside down flag? Uh, I live in New Braunfels, Texas, and there's a neighbor of mine who's uh, flying his flag upside down today. It's the sign of distress, a nation in distress. And General Walker, who you've seen in a few of these slides, um, flew three uh, US flags upside down outside of his home on Turtle Creek. And he's the one in the photo uh, being welcomed to the city by Mayor Earl Cabell. Uh, so. I was familiar with, with General Walker. Most, if, if anyone knows uh, that much about the assassination, know that Oswald uh, took a shot at uh, at Walker before he ever uh, tried to kill JFK. The, one of the surprising things that I didn't know uh, comes out in the book that he was involved uh, as a leadership position in the riot at the University of Mississippi that that greeted uh, the uh, James Meredith's uh, registration there. I was wondering if you talk about that. It was completely unknown to me. It was sort of a surprise that this man essentially led one of the largest armed insurrections in the United States. Since the Civil War, yeah, absolutely. Are some of you familiar with General Walker, General Edwin Walker from Dallas? Yeah. He was pretty famous. You see the cover of Newsweek. Uh, he uh, was really the hero of Little Rock. You know, Dwight Eisenhower did not want to call in federal troops to desegregate Central High School in Little Rock, but he finally really had no choice. And these angry mobs had prevented these nine black school children from entering the school. And the person he picked uh, was Edwin Walker from Texas, who, you know, was a pretty hardcore guy and uh, no-nonsense general. And when his troops showed up in Little Rock, you know, they had, he had them clip the bayonets to the end of their rifles. They dog-trotted through the streets, and any protesters left standing, you know, were you know, hit with uh, rifles, otherwise injured. He broke up the mob in less than an hour, registered the kids right away, and was seen as this great hero in America. Um, general Walker went on to become the division commander of the 24th Infantry on the front lines of the Cold War in West Germany. And um, he was one of those people who was really concerned about the communist infiltration. And he fell in with the John Birch Society, which believed at its core that even Eisenhower had become prey of the communist and was uh, really doing the communist He's bidding. A communist agent is what yeah. they really said. Yeah. And when, when Walker came to realize that, uh, he saw that he felt that Eisenhower had used him to advance communism uh, because, of course, integration, you know, would lead to mongrelization of our country and sap its vitality from within was the idea. And so Walker uh, felt that he'd been used by Eisenhower, and this insight really kind of radicalized him. And he began indoctrinating his troops in Germany, uh, who were equipped with nuclear weapons, uh, and, and basically far-right John Birch Society propaganda. He was telling them who to vote for. Other things military commanders should not be doing. And, um, he was also advocating essentially a first strike. Yes. And, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because I didn't want to join on too long with the story about Ted Dealey at the White House. Um, he, you know, he got a lot of attention for saying JFK was riding Caroline's tricycle. The other thing Ted Dealey said to JFK uh, is, 
we can annihilate Russia, and we should make that clear to the Soviet people. Undoubtedly, they will simultaneously destroy us, but it's better to die than to live in communism and slavery. Uh, Kennedy's military command and people like Ted Daly and also Bruce Alger knew that we had nuclear superiority over the Russians, and they wanted to use it while we had it. And there was a lot of pressure on Kennedy. And if that man did anything great as president, it was resisting this enormous pressure on him to go to war. Um, but anyway, with General Walker, once this news broke into the open of what he was doing, uh, Kennedy relieved him of command. And, um, you know, Walker became a real cause celeb among the far right. He was seen as the man on horseback who could really take back the country from Kennedy. Um, and, of course, he could have lived anywhere in the world, anywhere in the country he wanted to. And he picked Dallas, where he received a hero's welcome and uh, made Dallas the center of his increasingly violent uh, resistance to Kennedy. And um, basically, as Jerome was saying, this uh, ended up uh, taking him to Oxford, Mississippi. Um, I will say that General Walker ran for governor of Texas. And as Bill and I have traveled across the country, we've heard plenty of criticism of Texas politicians uh, on the road. But we can say that Texas does have a sane streak because we did not elect General Walker governor in 1962. Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> he came in last. But he did get a, about 150,000 votes, and he referred to that as his army of you know, people interested in freedom. And a lot of people from that army joined him to go to Oxford, Mississippi, to basically resist uh, the integration of Ole Miss. And it, as you saw in the newspaper headlines, it turned out to be a really horrible, horrible evening. Uh, people died. Dozens of US Marshals were wounded by gunfire. The campus was left in flames. And um, you know, you, you talk about archives. You know, uh, Kennedy, fortunately for history, had installed the taping system in the Oval Office just a couple of months before that. So you can go, and actually you can hear these online, his recordings, uh, as he and Bobby and other advisors are reacting in real time to what's happening in Oxford. You know, this the biggest armed resistance between the North and the South since the Civil War. And Kennedy is saying, you know, imagine that son of a bitch having been a division commander in Germany. And then later he picks up the phone and calls his solicitor general, I believe it was, and says, we want to arrest General Walker. And so uh, Walker was arrested for sedition and insurrection against the United States. And he was thrown into a federal psychiatric prison, despite the fact that no psychiatrist ever actually examined him. So if you don't think the Kennedys play hardball, Boy, did they play hardball. But they overextended they, their reach on that. He was he able did. to basically make mincemeat out of the, yeah. the psychiatric evaluations and all that. Yeah, and you know, when he was in federal custody, General Walker uh, was a true soldier. He only gave his name, rank, and serial number. So, One of the things, speaking of Oxford, Mississippi, that um, I, I interviewed uh, Bill a couple of months ago, and, and uh, uh, as you said earlier, uh, one of the things that I thought the, the book emphasized is that we see the Kennedy assassination so often through entirely through the lens of the Cold War, partly because of the things like the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Test Ban Treaty, but also because of the, the conspiracy theories that involve uh, Operation Mongoose and, and, and the Cubans. But Bill was making the argument that he felt that one of the real central uh, angers, the real bitter angerness against um, JFK was segregation, was, um, was racially motivated. Yeah. And, you know, I certainly concur with, with Bill's findings on that. He, he led our research into that area. Bill, as some of you may know, was a longtime reporter at the Dallas Morning News. He'd grown up in New York and moved to Texas and uh, got his first journalism job in Abilene and uh, went to San Antonio and Houston. And when he came to Dallas, um, he realized that there were stories not being told in this city, and they were stories south of the Trinity River. And so he made it really kind of his personal mission to go down and rescue the stories of many of the African Americans uh, in Dallas, and became really a very well-known, uh, highly respected, and decorated newspaper reporter for all of that. So Bill really had ac access and, and to a lot of these uh, insights about um, Dallas in that era. And, you know, he and I differed slightly because he felt that Dallas was very unique in regard to um, its uh, role in segregation and integration. And you know, Dallas shared a lot of characteristics with many southern cities. Um, and actually, I think one of the things, and we, and we did talk about this in the book, that really distinguished Dallas, and, and uh, is to Dallas's great credit, is that it did follow 
the ideas that Stanley Marcus had been laying out for years to the Dallas Citizens Council. It integrated very peacefully and almost uh, overnight when it happened. And that's in large part due to some of the other people you've seen in these photos. The woman who's boarding the train, if that photo show up of Juanita Craft, yeah. Um, have you heard of Juanita Craft, those of you who live in Dallas? Yeah, she's, you know, she's not really known nationally. It was so much fun to be able to write about this beautiful woman and the effect she had on Dallas, you know. Um, she began as a maid at the Adolphus Hotel, and uh, it was there that Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, you know, she went into Eleanor's room, and Eleanor saw something in Juanita as a young woman and told her, you know, don't give up, change is coming, keep fighting, keep working. And that really inspired her. And Juanita became a local leader in the NAACP, uh, beloved by many people, but particularly among children. She recruited hundreds and hundreds of teenagers to join the NAACP. And these were the kids who went out onto the front lines of the segregation battles and made it happen. Um, for example, the Woolworths downtown. You know, if you were a young African, or if you're African American at all, um, you could go and you could buy something from the art department. So you could buy like a, you know, paintbrush or something, but you could not uh, go get served at the soda fountain. And so one of these kids, uh, by the hundreds, would go into the store and they'd buy something very big and bulky, like a big pad of drawing paper and pay for their purchase in the art department, then walk over to the soda fountain, set down their purchase and ask for a soda. And they would be told, well, you can't have a soda. Well, I just bought this over in this part of the store. Why can't I have a soda in this part of the store? And we had, you know, the store was basically shut down. And this also happened at the movie theaters. It's really great to see that white students from SMU came over to support those actions too. And there were moments where you could really see that the common people in Dallas, you know, wanted to be together, wanted to work together to make the place a better city. And all this kind of clicked. And I think that's really, uh, it really frustrated people like General Walker. Um, most of the very conservative people in Dallas eventually acclimated themselves to, you know, public integration. But I think that's really what motivated Walker. He saw that the battle had been lost in Dallas. So he wanted to go to Oxford, to the new front line, and basically make his stand there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that was one of the events that I, I knew about. Um, but didn't see it. One of the things that your book does is kind of slot them into a sequence. I was aware that uh, Martin Luther King came to Dallas, but I didn't realize when and precisely how it worked. So I wonder if you could talk about that. Um, a lot of people aren't aware that, that he did come here, that he did speak at Fair Park. Well, you know, there was a, a bit of a, a schism among the African-American leadership in Dallas because you had people who, who didn't want to press too hard against the ruling oligarchy in terms of making integration happen. And then you had uh, younger, more aggressive people like the Reverend Rhett James, who this, his photo may be here too, uh, picketing outside of the H.L. Green drugstore. Um, and uh, Rhett James is also the man at the far left in the photo of, with Martin Luther King, along with a rabbi, Levi Olan. And, um, you know, Rhett James was uh, very well educated. He'd lived in various parts of the country. And, you know, he knew that the time had come to, for African Americans to be first class citizens, to no longer take a back seat. I will say, I don't mean to pick on the Dallas Morning News, which is a much better newspaper today than it was under Ted Dealey's reign uh, in the 1960s, but, um, you know, the NAACP uh, was referred to by the Dallas Morning News uh, as the National Association for the Agitation of Colored People. And uh, Ted Dilley's writers re re would call, you know, they would claim that all of these moves towards uh, integration were coming down from Washington, D.C., the Negro capital of the United States. And it was just really kind of ugly, uh, you know, stuff that was appearing in the paper. And so when Martin Luther King came, um, you know, the morning news basically just ignored his visit. You could see it was covered by the black press. And word certainly got out because he was met by you know, some pretty aggressive picketing. And then there was this uh, bomb threat. So you know, the place he was speaking at Fair Park, it was a music hall, I believe, um, had to be evacuated. And um, the guy who was leading the picketing, by the way, uh, was a fellow named Jimmy Robinson, who belonged to what was called the States Rights Party. And there were dozens of these kinds of crazed organizations at that time that had sprung up. And you know, the founder of the States Rights Party was a guy from Georgia who said that uh, Hitler was too moderate, you know, <laughs> and Jimmy Robinson, um, well, some of you may have heard that story that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald had written a note to the FBI agent James Hostie, and it was unsigned saying, you know, leave my wife alone, quit coming around, all that. Um, 
Hosty actually thought it was Jimmy Robinson who uh, had given him this note. He didn't realize it was Oswald. But Jimmy Robinson was well known to the Dallas police, uh, particularly because there was a um, Holocaust survivor in Dallas, a guy named Jack Oran, who um, had been in Germany in the 1930s, had seen the rise of Nazism, seen how a group of extremist minority had taken over the country and ruined it. And Jack Oran believed that the same thing might be happening in Dallas. And he had been a private man, never really spoken about his experiences, and he was inspired to go out and give talks to the Rotary Club and Kiwanis Club and things like that. And when word of that reached Jimmy Robinson, you know, a couple of months after Martin Luther King's visit, um, you know, Jack Oran came back from one of his talks to find the burning cross, you know, planted in his, his lawn. And um, just, again, contributed to this climate that there were dangerous things happening in Dallas. They never, the, the Dallas police never uh, found who was painting swastikas on the on Jewish storefronts in, in downtown Dallas. Right. And, uh, and these were stickers. These were professionally printed labels with the swastika that, uh, yeah. And I'm sorry. one of the things that, that uh, struck me as, as interesting, that pure co coincidence, I'm sure, that between the, the movie Parkland and your book is that they both take this, uh, this kind of uh, focused view of the, the events uh, around the assassination and both do nothing with the conspiracy theories. There's, there's nothing in your book that could, I mean, you, you don't go into where's E. Howard Hunt and, and all this, anything like that. Yeah. Why? Well, you know, thousands of other people are following that terrain and exploring those theories, and I'm happy to let them do that. You know, Bill and I felt like we were doing something that was not just an original perspective on the assassination by providing the context for what the city was like that people blamed for killing Kennedy. Um, you know, we were able to base ours on reality, too. You know, we, we have uh, dozens of archives across Texas and the United States that we were able to make use of. We could go in, you know, you could see Ted Dilley, for example, planning his ambush of John Kennedy, where he's writing out drafts of the comments that he's going to make and, you know, sending friends of his uh, other very conservative publishers letters telling his view of what happened inside the White House. And so you're able to really not just do conjecture, but to really get a sense of what people were actually were doing. And, and I will say, too, you know, I work at an archive, uh, a literary archive, where you know we have Corrette McCarthy's papers, as I mentioned, and you know the thing is when people do interviews or, with all due respect to the Sixth Floor Museum, which is a wonderful facility, it's a world class museum, and has done such a great job of honoring Kennedy's legacy. Um, the, the truth is, in oral interviews, people tend to wander a bit from what really happened. Um, I believe it was the publisher of the Dallas Times Herald who has an interview here who talks about how. It, his paper had always supported Kennedy. You know, it was the Dallas Morning News that hated Kennedy. Well, if you, know, if you go back, you see, well, the Times Herald also uh, endorsed Nixon, as did the Morning News. And, but when you go into the archives, you see what's happening almost in real time back then. And so there's no need to chase down you know, unreliable witnesses or you know, that kind of hazy stuff. It, it's so much more fun to talk about what was really happening. So you, one of the things that's uh, Remarkable about your book is this um, this this build up. I mean, things just keep happening, and, th and it keeps getting worse and worse, darker and darker, as it were. Um, so we have this this groundwork, as it were, for for why Dallas gained the reputation it, it it had. And then the president is shot by a kind of confused Marxist-Leninist. I mean, I've argued that that's one of the reasons conspiracy theories developed, is if he had been shot by General Walker's assistant, it would have been a direct line. It would have made sense. But it, Oswald doesn't make sense. Absolutely. And that's life, isn't it? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, after Kennedy was shot, before people, before anybody had been arrested for it, um, one of the things we found is the Dallas police headquarters, the switchboard was flooded with calls. And these were calls from housewives in Dallas. Each of them was sobbing, confessing that she was certain that it had been her husband who had killed the president. <laughs> you know, General Walker, uh, you know, he knew enough to get the hell out of Dallas in case something happened. And he was going from speaking to one white supremacist group in New Orleans to a different one in Shreveport. And he was on a plane when the news broke of the assassination. And you know, the first thing he did was go collect the names and information on all the other passengers so he would have witnesses for his alibi. Um, so 
you know, it was, uh, as far as Oswald goes, um, you know, and it's, it's such an easy logical leap to make, too, you know, where you had this, you had this, and, and, you know, our reviews have generally been very, very good, and we were pleased by that, but, but there have been some reviewers who have said things like, you know, for all their hand-wringing over the far right, you know, it was a communist who killed the president. And that's a very fair question. And um, I would say a couple of things about that. Um, one is, you know, Oswald described himself as a Marxist communist, um, but he was a terrible communist, let's face it. You know, the guy defected to the Soviet Union. He couldn't hack it. He came crawling back to the USA. Um, he despised the working class. The Soviet handlers gave him low marks on everything. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when you study Oswald's character, you see that he's more than just a, a self-identified communist. He's really an, a misfit and a violent person. You know, he had higher than average intelligence. Um, he believed that he was destined to do something special. And that's one of the reasons he had trouble in the Soviet Union. They just put him to work at a radio factory. Um, and he was a violent person, too. You know, he beat his wife. Um, he tried to kill General Walker. And, you know, a, another criticism that we've heard, which I also believe is fair, although I think it slightly misinterprets what we're trying to do in the book, is people, some people have said, um, you know, are you blaming Dallas, you know, for, for killing Kennedy? Are you saying that Dallas inspired Oswald to kill Kennedy? And, you know, with all the research we did, Jerome, we did not find the secret tape recording of Oswald confessing that, you know, Dallas had made him kill Kennedy. Um, and all of that's in the realm of conjecture. But what we are saying is that if you have somebody who is prone to violence, uh, is a misfit, and uh, is highly agitated, and his wife, say, breaks up with him the night before uh, Kennedy comes to town, you know, you have a place that can perhaps influence uh, somebody to, to, to violence. And, um, you know, the other thing about that, too, and really the lessons that you see from what happened in Dallas uh, that apply today, no matter what your political stripe is, you know, there's a huge difference between uh, what happens in a democracy. In a democracy, People of different political positions argue with each other and eventually more or less compromise. What happened in Dallas is that people were saying that their political opponent, John Kennedy, was not just an opponent, he was an enemy of the state. He was wanted for treason. He was a traitor to the United States. You know, what happens to people who are traitors or uh, guilty of treason? Well, they're sentenced to death. And when people cross that line and start defining political opponents as enemies of the state, then you're no longer functioning as part of a democracy, you're functioning as part of a totalitarian system. And that's really what we're trying to draw attention to in our book, that, that those things should not be allowed to happen in America. Uh, you were given uh, cards when you came in. I just wanted to remind you, if you do have questions, you can fill them out. They will be collecting them, and, and we'll be getting to some of them in uh, a few minutes. But now I wanted to, to ask you, uh, in going through the book, um, I was checking the, the notes in the back, the biography and everything, uh, because you did so much archival research. What, what about film? We saw the, the uh, documentary just now. What about film and television? Did, the, mm -hmm. did any of that influence what you were writing about? Yeah, it, it really helped quite a bit. And you, know, um, you can see a lot of what we write about on YouTube, or at least not as much as we would like to see, but certainly, you know, the day that Kennedy uh, was in, you know, November 22nd in Fort Worth, you can basically follow everything that happened that day uh, through archival footage. You can see Walter Cronkite, as we saw in the film earlier, you know, breaking into the regular programming and um, telling what's happening. And, you know, you know as well as I do that uh, what appears in newspapers uh, is the best approximation of what happened and there are often unintended errors, uh, sometimes in perspective, sometimes in facts. And so when you can actually see something yourself, it, it gives you a chance to slow reality down, to pay attention to what's happening, be able to, to get a good sense of things going on. Um, we, you know, there are just very small clips of Adlai Stevenson at UN Day, for example. We couldn't find any footage of the mink coat mob, unfortunately. So we relied a lot on press accounts and a lot on letters people were sending to each other describing what happened and so forth. But the little bit of film that we did find was immensely valuable, and hopefully more will turn up. I like the incident um, with the, the attack on Adelaide Stevenson, the woman that actually hit him, claimed that she didn't hit him. And there's a photo of her hitting him. <laughs> yeah. she, she claimed that she was pushed from behind by a Negro 
who caused her to hit Ambassador Stevenson. And of course, the TV footage, there was nobody behind her. Um, Are there any more questions that people have written? We'll be getting to them. No hard questions, please. Only easy ones. <laughs> I, I was given one at the, uh, before we started, which actually I could answer. It says, do you think it will happen again? And the interesting thing is that I, I interviewed uh, John Weidman, who is the, uh, the author, uh, the libretto um, of the musical Assassins with Stephen Sondheim, that Theater 3. And I asked him that question because he made the statement that four presidential assassins, assassinations, successful ones within 100 years, plus the numbers around that who didn't succeed. I mean, we have uh, Lincoln, McKinley, Garfield, and, and Kennedy. There were other ones that di didn't succeed against FDR, for instance, against Teddy Roosevelt. So that's a lot of political murder. And so I said an interesting thing, though, is that they were inspired to write the musical because, partly because of um, the attack on Ronald Reagan and the, the shooting of, of John Lennon. And he was saying there was this sense in the 80s that this was just a regular event. We were waiting for the next one. And I said, and nothing's happened since. And he said, I've thought about that for years since that musical opened. I kept waiting for the next one to happen. And I said, what, did that mean? what do you think that means? And he says, I don't know. He said, I think that it might mean that we have gotten better at preventing these, that we have gotten better at um, forecasting, as it were. If you th occasionally will find a, you know, a newspaper report of someone who's threatened the president and had a gun and went somewhere publicly and was, and was arrested. So you occasionally see those sorts of things. So he may be right, but Weidman said, I'm still thinking, I'm still trying to wonder, we're actually, in a way, overdue, because it's happened about every 20 years, and it's been more than 20 years since the, the attempt on, on Ronald Reagan. There have been people who you know, took a shot at the uh, Clinton White House, for instance. But in terms of a serious, actual, close-in attempt, um, it hasn't happened. So um, uh, uh, Weidman said, I want to ask the Secret Service, but I'm afraid of what they'll tell me. Uh, anyway, Sean, thank you. <laughs> ah, yes, this is one of the surprising things I learned, too. One of the surprising things I learned in the book was about General Walker's secret personal life. Can you talk about this? Yeah. Um, some of you may know that General Walker uh, made some headlines later in his life about 10 or 12 years after this period. Um, um, he was arrested twice in public restrooms in Dallas by undercover police officers, uh, you know, fondling them and so forth. And I want to just say thanks to my brother Jeff Davis, who's here, who helped do a lot of the research for us in Dallas with things like that. Down Walker's police record. And, um, you know, part of the question for us was, um, you know, and that, that was part of that lore, that folklore in Texas that you hear about is, you know, this crazy General Walker was also secretly gay. And, um, what Bill and I are trying to find through Walker's FBI files and various other government documents, his psychiatric report and so forth. And by the way, Walker's archives are at UT Austin and you know, he just turned over boxes and boxes of stuff. So real credit to him for that. Um, but we were looking to see if how well it was known or, or if it was known about his sexual history earlier in his life during this time period. And you know, we didn't want to sensationalize it, of course, but we wanted to at least put it in proper context in terms of describing who he was. And, um, and he certainly was, noted at the time, the word used was eccentric. Uh, he is a noted eccentric who appears to have no interest in women, you know, um, and I think they said the same thing about J. Edgar Hoover, you know, we had a congressman denounce Walker and, you know, saying, oh, he's described as an eccentric, just like our director of the FBI. And so um, there were these, yeah, so, so there's that. There, there is a bit of that story and, um, you know, our book, uh, we do not go into the assassination itself. The book ends really with, after this outpouring of love, for JFK on the streets. Uh, Nellie Connolly, as some of you know, turned around to John Kennedy and said, you can't say that Dallas doesn't love you, Mr. President. And those are the last words he heard. Um, and we do have an epilogue that sort of brings you up to date on each person. So that's where you hear more of the story of General Walker and really everybody else. Ted Dilley, by the way, uh, loved animals. So yes. shout out to Ted for that. Uh, a number of people uh wrote the same sort of question, variations of the same question. Um, has Dallas changed significantly since 1963? Some might argue it has not, because um, there's plenty of anger at President Obama. Uh, other people have asked if the, uh, the, 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 the city's um, leadership has, has changed in 50 years. You know, um, as we've traveled around the country, we get that question a lot. And we, t and we talk about really the difficult period Dallas went through, you know, being saddled with the image of the city that killed Kennedy. 
and um, how it's really kind of woven itself in, into the fabric of Dallas. But you really see, I think, the city turn around. Uh, you know, of course, the TV series Dallas helped, the Dallas Cowboys success helped in the 1970s. But really, when this building was preserved and this world-class museum was established here as a place that really honored Kennedy in a very dignified way and did a hell of a good job telling the story of what happened. Um, I think that shows how Dallas matured and has become the world-class city that Stanley Marcus envisioned it becoming. Uh, could you touch briefly on the attempt to kill General Walker? One of the things I learned that I found surprising was that General Walker was one of the first people to make the connection. Yeah. To, so I was wondering if you could yeah. touch briefly on the attempt. Yeah. It's, um, it's a little known story in American history, but Leo Harvey Oswald did have an earlier target before John Kennedy, and that was General Walker. Um, you know, he uh, basically saw Oswald, at, uh, or Oswald basically saw Walker as um, a real threat to America. He saw Walker as another Hitler, as he told his wife, Marina. You know, he said, if somebody killed Hitler in time, it could have changed history. And so Oswald, you know, not only magnified his own importance, he magnified Walker's importance. And he did uh, stalk General Walker, April 1963, Walker had just returned from this uh, tour across the speaking tour across the South, where he, you know, said John Kennedy is an enemy to freedom and things like that. Um, and um, you know, Oswald did qualify as a marksman in the Marines, so he was not like a great shot, but he was a pretty damn good shot. And um, General Walker was sitting in the back of his house. Uh, it was evening; it was nine o'clock at night, and the lights were on. There were no window shades, and so Walker, uh, Oswald had a perfect view into the house from about. 30 or 40 yards away, I believe, and fired the shot. And um, it passed through the general's hair uh, and thudded into a wall and you know, exploded plaster all over a big stack of Walker's uh, patriotic pamphlets deriding John Kennedy. And um, the investigators figured out what happened. You know, Oswald, uh, when he finally got back home after taking several buses and walking long ways, um, told his wife, you know, God, I can't believe I missed, you know, when he heard the news that Walker uh, had not been killed. But the investigators determined that the shot actually had been straight, but there was that thin wood uh, cross section of the screen, and the bullet hit that, and that deflected it just enough to miss the temple and go through the hair. And um, it's kind of a chilling story. And, you know, and it was right after that when the swastikas uh, appeared on Neiman Marcus and other places downtown. Stanley Marcus's own house was targeted, too. And... Um, General Walker's chief aide, by the way, was uh, very active and very prominent in the American Nazi Party. So, um, you know, there's a possibility, at least, that uh, this was a reaction to the assassination attempt. Oswald's attempt on Walker, it's often seen as kind of a, a flukish thing or an indication of his, uh, his instability. It actually becomes, it's, it's very consistent with assassins. Um, Hinckley, who, sh who shot Reagan, had a long list of targets, including Jackie Kennedy. Uh, Arthur Bremer, who shot Governor Wallace, was had stalked Richard Nixon, but found it too difficult. Um, uh, John Wilkes Booth's original plan was to uh, kidnap Lincoln. Each one of them basically were opportunists. They were looking at different plans, and they changed, when, and they got lucky, in a way. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with, with Oswald. I think the, the, the sense of the need to, to force themselves onto the national stage is, is really what mattered more than anything else. That's an excellent point. Uh, who made the final decision to leave the clear roof off the president's vehicle? I would think the FBI, I think they mean the, social, uh, the Secret Service, would uh, require it to be on if they knew Dallas was such a concern. Um, we talk about that slightly in the book, but that, again, gets into the mechanics of the assassination, which did not interest us as much because that terrain had been so well covered. But my understanding is that the, um, you know, John Kennedy, if the weather was clear, did not want a ride under a bubble top. Jackie Kennedy sure as hell did because, you know, the open air messed up her hairdo. Um, and so when the rain cleared in Dallas, you know, that was just the way things were done. He took the bubble top off. But also, um, my understanding is that the bubble top was not bulletproof, that it was rainproof, but not bulletproof. So it, you know, I'm sure it would have made it harder to, you know, have the bullet go and hit the president, but um, it was not, he would not have been totally secure with it on. The Morning News ran a uh, series uh, today, a uh, pullout, in which they uh, tracked a number of the, uh, the items, the iconic items uh, that, from the assassination, including the, um, the, the limousine. And uh, I was born and raised in Detroit when I visited uh, a couple of years ago. I was surprised to find out that the limousine is in 
um, <laughs> Greenfield Village, Henry Ford Museum in, in Detroit. Um, but it, you can go there and see it. Um, and it's so, sort of a shock because it's all you're going through this museum about cars, and then you come across this, and it's like you would think Ford would not exactly want to be proud of this vehicle, but, but there it is. Yeah. And oh, uh, one last question Would you consider writing a sequel about <laughs> Dallas today, comparing? Uh -huh. You know, Bill and I, uh, we had a wonderful time working together on this book, and we do have our eyes on it, on a second book. And, um, you know, we felt that we were able to really go in and kind of reinterpret the Kennedy assassination by focusing on the sense of place, on the setting that had been overlooked. And so our plan, hopefully, is to be able to do that with Los Alamos in 1945 and to really talk about the making of the atomic bomb and having this highly technological, globally-oriented culture planted in the middle of really the last traditional place in America where you know, Native Americans are living in uh, communal societies in very traditional ways and it's just kind of a cataclysmic moment in America really. And that's part of that story that's been overlooked, so we'll see. But uh, hopefully, you know, whenever you do books like this, you hope that it, just as Bud Schrake influenced me, you know, you hope that you open the doors for other people to, to keep running with the ideas and take the research farther and bring forth new discoveries. I should remind you that Stephen will be autographing copies of the books right now. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Jim.